Hello, this is Mike again from Scratch, and today we're going to be looking at a very fundamental programming task. And it's one of those things that, strangely enough, isn't taught, and I have no idea why. But if you go through a college or university programming, there's a pretty good chance that you are never going to be taught how to use a debugger. Same way as if you pick up a programming language, I want to learn C++, I want to learn Java, etc. You will never, ever have a chapter in there on here's how you debug. And there's a reason for that. A lot of the times the debugging is specific to the tool you're using. For example, in today, we're going to be using Visual Studio, and Visual Studio has some um, traits that are individual to it. So if you picked up the book, like Learn Visual C++ 2015 or 2017 or whatever, or learning Eclipse, learning WebStorm, if it's such a book exists, then they probably will cover debugging. But if you're just learning, say, C++, you pick up Miyarni Strustrup's C++ book, there's going to be nothing in there on debugging. And that makes sense from the perspective of that book, but it makes no sense from the perspective of a learner. Debugging is probably the top two or three level skills that you should know. This is stuff that will save you hundreds to possibly thousands of hours across your career, possibly even in a single year. Now, if you already know the basics of debugging, there's probably gonna be nothing in this video for you. Again, this is one-on-one -on -one level stuff, but if you're the type of person that is monitoring your program's execution, using a bunch of console out or print statements or alerts, that kind of thing, what I'm about to show you here will in fact change your life. Now, debug Debugging is essential skill. This is one of those things everybody should know. Now this um, video is actually coming kind of as a response to an article I did uh, some two years ago and it's still being checked uh, on a daily basis. Google hits all the time so there is a group of people out there looking for it. So I figured I'd do this in video form as well. Now this particular video covers pretty much everything we're going to talk about and then at the end it actually goes into some specifics uh, for not C++ code. Uh, so we get in down here you can start seeing I've got JavaScript um, debugging in Chrome examples. I've got uh, WebStorm, I think, and a couple of others, Eclipse uh, for Java developing, etc. And you will generally find that debugging is debugging. So it's just a matter of figuring out your specific tool. But if somewhere down in the future you do want to see um, more languages, you know, more tools covered for how you go ahead and debug with them, I can make quick supplemental videos to go on top of this one. So let me know in the comment down below. Now, without further ado, let's jump right in. Now, if you look here, this is a very, very simple project I've created. It's a completely contrived, completely stupid C++ code. Um, there is no logic to it. There's nothing really special here. It is just some code that I can use to demonstrate the various different things we need when we want to start debugging. And from the very beginning, let's do that. The first thing we need to do is actually start debugging. So come on up here to start debugging your code. Go ahead and press start debugging. Now you'll notice my code I don't know why it focused that window after the fact. Immediately ran and exited. That's because it's actually a console application and you can't see the output. Now, if you hit Control and F5, now this is specific to Visual Studio, it will run and then end with this press any key to continue so you can easily see the output. Another option you can have is actually you can direct the output to this you know, window in here. Uh, but the, the output of the console app isn't particularly important. What is is you understand there are two ways you can run your program, basically debug and release. And you want to, to do any of the stuff we're about to do, you want to make sure that your build is a debug build and that when you run it, you run it as a debugger. Now there's also remote window debugging. This is actually debugging on another machine over an IP address type thing. We're not going to cover that today, but do be aware that it does exist. Uh, you can also start debugging via the window, start debugging, and as you can see the hotkey I use there is F5. So that is how you run your code. Now let's get to the very first thing that you should know about debugging, and that is breakpoints. Now this is a very important thing to understand. You'll see the specifics of how I create a breakpoint in Visual Studio are going to change from IDE to IDE, language to language, but they all have the same concept. A breakpoint is exactly as its name sounds like. A breakpoint is where your code will break when you start execution. So for example, here is the entry point for our particular code. What we wanna do right away is see right here, so we'll break there. So we'll break after some value has been given the value of zero and before the return value of this said function. So a break point, I just click over here to the side. The other thing you can do is just basically on the line you want it to be on, you can come up to debug and toggle breakpoint. As you can see, you can also use F9. Uh, in the same function, also as it says toggle, you can use the same logic to turn it off. You can also right click it and delete or disable it. 
and get back here to conditions later on. That's a very important subject for a later point. So now we have this breakpoint set. Let's go ahead and debug our code and you'll see exactly what happens. So boom, our code runs and immediately it stops in the debugger. So the breakpoint is hit. You can see this little um, arrow and that marks our current line of code. And the nice thing is now we can come in here and hover over value. So you see uh, if I hover over some value, we'll see it was passed in nothing. I can look hover over arg c, you can see it's passed in a value of one. Our arg values is an array and we can actually drill down into it to see each entry like so. So the beginning of uh, the first parameter arg c is always the actual program that's being executed. So you can see here in string form, and then we drill into that a little bit more detail. We see that's actually the first character there. We'll get into um, those results and how that stuff works in a moment. Now, the next most important thing is to understand how navigation works in your program. What you've got next, and this is going to be every single debugger has this functionality. So if you have a debugger, this will work. And you've got next statement, step into, step over, step out. Now, step into basically goes into the next line of code. So you can see right here, we're on some val equals outer function. Now this line of code hasn't evaluated yet. So basically we've paused execution of our code and now we're gonna be using almost like a VCR style controls to move forward. Now step over would jump immediately to this next line. But what we actually wanna do is step into this function call. So that's what this call right does. So we go step into, and you'll see we just jumped into the, uh, the outer function call, and now we can continue running it like so. So I could actually just keep using step into, we'll go to the next line, and then you see we have another function call here, and we're going to now step into it as well, like so. Oops, I'm not on it yet. So let's do that again, and now you see we jumped into the inner function code here. And again, we can hover over, we can see the input that we passed in. So here's the here was I as we came in, and there it is there again. So the majority of the time when you're navigating your code, it's just sort of like slow motion tracking through a videotape. This is what you're going to want to do if you want more and more detail. And there's where step into is very, very useful. Now, one thing that while we're in here, and the reason why I had this outer function and inner function, so basically we have our main class called outer function, which in turn called inner function. Well, this is very cool for demonstrating something called a call stack. And you can see that right here, this window down here, and every single debugger, again, will have a call stack of some form. And what this is very useful for, so we're currently on, you know, let's move in a couple lines. Um, so I have to be very careful with these because they actually have the same uh, hotkeys as my video recording app, which is unfortunate. Uh, so let's step in, step in. All right, so here we're at the beginning of a loop. And now, it, um, so here's where our particular point of evaluation is. Now what this call stack does, this is like any stack, like think of um, a stack of plates, the bottom stack, and then you put the next one on top and the next one on top. Well, we started in, main, and then we call outer function. So you see outer function and then inner function. This gives you a way to basically see how your code is currently nested down. So we can actually navigate backwards up the call stack and see, so this jumps back to inner function so you can see where it was called and then we can do it again at main. So this is a good way of seeing how our code drills down. So when we're many levels deep, this becomes very, very useful. Now where it becomes exceedingly useful is when your code is spanning multiple files. So you're in a library somewhere um, that was called and you wanna see, okay, well, where was this particular code called from? Well, you can walk up and down that particular bit of information by using the call stack. Now the thing at the very top is the most recent or the deepest layer in the call stack. And as it goes back, it goes back this way. Now you'll see sometimes the call stack will have something like external code, especially if your code you're debugging is a lot library, it might be called from an executable you have no control over. Uh, but ultimately, this is the call hierarchy of the current um, uh, current line of code that you are debugging. So a call stack is a very important concept to understand. Now, another thing that I'm going to cover right now is the rest of these steppings. So we've stepped over. So let me do a step over here and see what we've done is we basically jumped over an execution of that list. Um, it's more effective back in a minute. I'll show you it better in, in another example, but the last thing we're gonna do is to step out. And basically what this does is jumps you up a level in the call stack. So all of this code is still gonna run. We're just not gonna watch it line by line. So instead of going through this loop uh, 42 times, I can just go, all right, 
step out and you see it immediately jumps out of inner function and then I could do a step out again and you'll see we're immediately back to where we are now at this point in time outer function has in fact finished running and I forget exactly what value it returned uh, whatever the result of inner function is input so it looks like this is just gonna return 42 now it hasn't still hasn't quite happened yet we're gonna step forward one more line so let's do that step forward one and now you see some value has a value of 42 now i'm going to stop for a second i'm going to illustrate the step over instead so let's stop the debugging and we're going to start it all over again so there it is here is our breakpoint hit now last time what we did was did a step in so we started evaluating how this outer function is going to be called let's say we don't give a damn what we do instead there is step over now this function was still called. So look, if we, if we hover over some value, you see it has been assigned the value of 42. So you just, it's basically your way of sort of like a mini fast forward or chapter skip on a DVD. It's like you're saying, okay, I'm good with the way this line of code works, jump to the next block. That code is still evaluated, it is still run, but you just don't watch it line by line like what we saw before. Now once again, I'm gonna stop and I wanna show you one other thing. So instead of stopping, I could actually do a restart start thing from the beginning and same basic results so here we are we're at this line again so what i'm going to do this time is i'm going to step into this code so here we are again in the uh the outer function it's the actually this loop i'm interested in showing you something for so let's go in so we're going to step into this function so boom we just stepped in so now we're running so we're at the very beginning of this function you can see so there's our input etc so now let's jump to the next line Okay, so this line of code here is just there to run. Um, it doesn't really do anything. It basically is just going to count up every time this loop runs. And let's look at it. So you see its value is zero. So let's go ahead and do a run of our loop. As you can see the loop ends, and we're now at uh, i is 42 at this run. So we'll step in. So you'll see now i is now 41, and our meaningless, meaningless counter has been updated to one. Well, that's very, very cool. However, what happens if you're in a loop that has, uh, say, 10,000 entries, or even, to be honest, 42? Do you want to repeat that process 42 times? I sure as hell do not want to do that. So now what we're going to do is come in here, and I'm going to set a breakpoint right there. It's the same process as before. Just left-click here in the sidebar. I'm going to right-click it and set a condition on it. And this is called a conditional breakpoint. Now, this is one of the things that's going to be available in 99.9% .9 of debuggers, but some may not have it. And what we can do now is basically say on this condition, so when this happens, go ahead and run this particular breakpoint. So you can see here, conditional breakpoint, the conditional expression uh, is true. So when what we evaluate here is true. And right here, you basically just write a line of code. So what we're gonna do, say we wanna see when i is equal 42, that's the only time we wanna break here. Or you could do this as, um, or i is greater than 64 or whatever. So only under certain conditions is that breakpoint ever going to be hit. So we shall go ahead and set that. So we'll say, we'll do exactly that, i equals uh, 24. All right, so we now have a conditional breakpoint so so this is a breakpoint that will only happen when that condition is true we'll go ahead and continue and we shall see that i is now equal to 24. so that is where a conditional breakpoint comes in so if you want to break but only when a certain criteria or condition is true now there's a couple of other options you saw there but for the most part a conditional is going to be used exactly as we just did so if you want to get into the more advanced stuff this is an exercise for the reader to look up otherwise this video could go on for a very very long time all right, so a quick summary of what we've covered so far. A breakpoint causes your code to stop or pause execution so you can take control of it and walk through lines of code manually. Your basic controls are step into, which digs deeper into the code, step over, which evaluates to the next line of code so all the current code is still run, but it moves to the next point, or we've got step out. Now there's one other process that we've got here. Uh, let me just delete my breakpoint. We don't need that anymore. You can normally right click and run to cursor. And what this will do is run to that location. So the code just ran, continued on to that particular point in time. I can do that anywhere. I don't have to be in the same function. I could have instead uh, run to this location. And then boom, you see we, we and it jumps forward in time. Now it did go ahead. This code was evaluated. This code was evaluated. So if you hover over data, you will see data has a value, etc. So there's the uh, step in, 
goes deeper in or digs down more detail. Step over basically evaluates the next line. And step out is when you're somewhere down in the call stack and you want to jump back to the calling function. Everything is still in all three of these cases. The code is all still run. It's just how it's run or how it's displayed to you that's important. And this little guy over here is critical because this is the current about to be run. It hasn't been run yet, but the about to be run statement. Now, one thing that might have been a little confusing is when I jumped over that or you go through a loop like this, it seems like it was, um, you know, you have to press the button a couple times. Well, the reason for this is um, each semicolon here is actually a line terminator. So there are more than one functions going on here. So there's a, the uh, initial allocation and then there's the increment here. So there's actually two lines of code on that single line here. So it's not line by line, it's code by code. So executable code by executable code. So that's why you have to double press while you're in a particular loop. All right, so that's the basics of running around and navigating. And again, anytime you want, you can go ahead and jump to this next line of code. Now, do keep in mind, if you jump to a line of code that happens to have a breakpoint in between, that breakpoint will still be hit. So at that point, you probably want to go ahead and disable that breakpoint. Now, you might be wondering, what's the difference between delete and disable the breakpoint? Well, disable the breakpoint stops it from running during this particular session. So from when I press start to basically when I press stop, that particular breakpoint will be gone unless I re-enable it. Now, deleting it means it'll be gone for good. Now, the next time I run this code, so if I go ahead and say, all right, this code is disabled and stop. Now, if I go ahead and run it, that breakpoint is still there. It's not going to run, but now I can easily come back here and enable it again and come back in and boom, we're going to hit it again. Now, if I delete it, it's gone. So when I come back in, it's still gone. So that is where your basic different toggles for the breakpoints are. Now, if you've gone through and over time, you've set a whole whack of breakpoints. Don't, don't actually think that this isn't going to happen. It is a lot. When you're just trying to figure out what the hell is wrong, it's one of those things you're going to very commonly do. And it's going to often be across many different files as you're trying to figure out you know, what you're debugging, frankly. And when you're going to try and get down to it, you'll end up with all of these breakpoints all through your code. And getting rid of them can be annoying. Now, keep in mind, you don't have to. You can actually come in here and go delete all breakpoints or disable all breakpoints. So yep, and say yes, and then boom, they're all gone. And that's really handy again when your breakpoints are across dozens of files. And it does happen. It's one of those things that is a very big time save. All right, so we got the basis of how we navigate through our code, how we can jump through a loop using conditionals, and uh, how the call stack works. Now, what we haven't really looked at, well, we looked at it briefly, but how um, we actually look at the data in our code. And you see down here, I've got a bit more data. I've got a very, very simple example here. Um, so we've dealt with functions and code navigation. Next up, again, in data, um, what I've done here is I've created a char array of 1,000 characters. I have a for loop that jumps through it 1,000 times and fills it, or 990, uh, yeah, 900. Anyways, yeah, runs through it 1,000 times, fills it with the character A, and then it fills the very last character with zero, just so that it's a null terminated string. Now, null terminated strings is exactly the kind of thing you're going to debug on occasion. And what we can do now is look at this particular guy. So this pointer for data, let's let's look at it with a little bit more detail. So what I'm gonna do is before we print it out here, or actually right after. So I'll set a breakpoint here. So the last line of code will have been the C out statement. And we shall go ahead and run our code. All right, so our code all just ran. Um, we're past the point, so we can hover over and we can see there's a string with a whole lot of A's in it. And we can dig into that string if we really want. So we can go down there, and we can see that the first value has the value of 97 or the ASCII character of A. And that's the detail we're getting there, but this isn't probably exactly what we want to do. And you also see over here that we can actually pin that value. So as I'm hovering, it tends to go away. I can come all the way over to the other end, pin that, and then have this information available a little bit easier. And we can also come back and unpin, and it goes away. Now generally, this isn't how you're going to want to work. What you're going to want to work with is data windows. And you look down here, we have a couple. First off, we have autos. Auto is, um, trying to think, I think auto is basically just it guessing for us. But what we've got here is local. Now, locals is very powerful. Locals basically is all of the variables at this current level of scope. So you can see here, we're inside of the main function, which has the variable argc, argv, some val, uh, data, 
and uh, eventually demo, but we're not there yet, but you'll see D is there as well. So, and that's key, we're not at D yet, so keep that in mind. But all of these values are in the local scope, and you can see here in the locals the details of them. So fortunately, I can't zoom this easily. Uh, I hopefully can do it when I do the video editing. So let's look at argc, or argv. Argv is the argument value passed in, which is our character string as shown here. And you can see there is the address of said string and there is the content of said string. Now later on, we'll look at data and data will show you this in a little bit more detail. But I'm gonna show you that when we get into, actually, you know what, let's go ahead and do that now. So data is a simple, uh, let's go on back. Data is a very simple class I made right here. It's got a string and an int and a bool. And I'll go ahead and it hasn't evaluated yet, so you'll notice it's not there. Uh, so you'll see when it tries to evaluate, it knows what it's capable of. So you can see the string value equals and then garbage, int value equals and then garbage, boolean value equals and then garbage. It hasn't evaluated yet, which is why this is showing us gibberish. And this is the kind of thing you'd actually want to see in um, in your debugging. These are the kind of values that will often blow your code up. So we've got an unevaluated class yet, and that totally makes sense because we haven't run it yet. So I'm just gonna go ahead and we will jump, um, we'll do a step over, so we're on the next line, and now you see D has been allocated, uh, allocated. And we can jump into that particular piece of code, and now we can expand it out, and you see there is our string value, there is our int value, and there is our Boolean value. So very, very, very useful. and. Um, where you might find this on top is if you got a variable that you persistently want to watch. So it may be a global, it may not always be in the local scope, uh, especially a global will not be in the local scope per se. It could be a variable you're watching from another class, it could be a function that's passed in, something like that, but something you basically want to keep a watch on. And that is when this guy comes in handy. So I'm going to hover over our D, any usage of D, so you could go anywhere I actually used a piece of data. Right click it, and we are going to say add watch. And what this does, I've already done it once, but you'll see here it gets added to a list, and we're in our watch window. And this is basically just me saying these are pieces of data I want to keep my eye on. So if I wanted to watch data as value as well, I would go ahead and do an add watch. And let me go ahead and restart our code. And I'll do a breakpoint at the beginning here, and you can see. So here is our code, here is our watch window, so data. you notice data has no value as of yet. I will start walking through our code, keep an eye. So data was newly created, and you see there it was allocated, and it's got garbage in it as of yet. Uh, so now we're gonna be basically looping through it. Uh, I don't really wanna loop through this this many times, but you can see as I'm going, you can see the live update each run through the loop. And then of course, again, I don't wanna do a thousand runs to that. So I'm just gonna to go to this next line here and say run to the cursor. So it's gonna jump out of our loop, finish it, allocating and running through the loop. And then you can see the value there again. Now, one thing you might notice here with this particular piece of data is it's bigger than our watch window or our hover window. So what do you do in this particular case? Well, that's where another neat little feature comes up. Now, if you go up to the debug category at the top here and go to Windows, if you're running or currently debugging your code, there are a whole lot of options available here. And the one that we're particularly interested in is memory. So we're gonna bring up memory one, so there you go. So this is basically a memory viewer. We can say, what is at the memory at this particular location? Well, how do I come up with the location? That is this value right there. So this OX0 blah, blah, blah. And that's the hexadecimal address in memory that this particular data structure is occupying. So we can come up to this guy. Like so and go OX011D1CA8 and click. And there you go, we just jumped in. We can see our particular, um, basically, this is the data starting at that address. And this is the next chunk, the next chunk. And over here, you can see the um, the represented value. So this is your hexadecimal value. Uh, this is your decimal or string uh, rendition of it. And if we scroll this on down, you can see at the end of our data, end of our data, and then our null terminator should be there. Now, I don't know why you're, I don't know why we got a couple of FDs going on. Uh, which actually is a good cause for uh, debugging at a later date. So this is the kind of reason why you would go ahead and jump in and look at things as raw data uh, 
and how you can basically drill into memory at particular memory locations. And every piece of data does have a memory location, but especially useful for in this case, especially in C++, is when you're dealing with references or pointers. You can at any time jump in and look specifically at the memory there. Now keep in mind, some of this memory beyond it is just gibberish. But this is part of our program. So you can see uh, hard disk volume demo. So this is probably, yeah, this is the path to our code. Now, you don't really want to touch any of this per se, but if you do want, if you're well, you're debugging, you can actually come in. Um, okay, not here. And change said values and you see it's updated there and it will update on the fly in your code now that is only changing the value in memory when you run it again this value will no longer be there but it is quite useful for doing um, testing quick on the fly changes or if you actually want to introduce a bug in your code but without actually introducing a bug in your code you can go into the memory itself and make tweaks to it I know this isn't something you're commonly going to be doing most of the time when you're looking at memory it's to do things like um, I've loaded a texture into memory. I know that it's going to expect the first eight bytes to be of this signature or whatever. Now let me go in and take a look at it or to look for the terminator for a particular string, the null terminator, etc. And that's why you would come into this memory area. All right, so that is memory. And really, I think the only other thing I really want to cover today is one last guy you will notice down here. Uh, well, if you really want, you can jump into the assembly. <laughs> And there you see the actual assembly code being generated by our particular code. For most people, this isn't really that useful uh, unless something has gone really, really wrong. But don't worry yourself about that too much other than being aware of the fact that it exists. Uh, but what is quite interesting is Quick Watch. Now, Quick Watch is where I can basically come in and deal with any code on the fly. So right here, for example, I could say some val. So I'll type some val. And you can see it will figure out what sum val is. Like so. What we can also do with Quick Watch is actually kind of evaluate expressions on the fly. So it's often called an expression evaluator in different ways. So I could do, and then you'll see the end result was that. Or I could even go one step further and call a particular line of code. Actually, let's do inner function. Um, 112. Oops. And reevaluate, and you will see there is said return value from the function inner function. And you'll notice if I go back and look at inner function again, it took a parameter of input, etc. So if you want to do quick evaluations for, you know, if I get if I passed in x value, what result would I get? Quick watch is your friend, and you can type in just about any valid line of code here, and it will evaluate. And where this becomes really handy is when you are dealing with a pointer or a class, such as, again, this demo. So let's jump down to our line of code. So our breakpoint triggered, demo is now valid. Let's jump over so that it is allocated. I will bring back up quick watch. So again, I can bring quick watch. So I could go D and then you will see the value of D or I could go D dot. I forget the actual values within D. Um, let me look here. All right, the dot int value, and there is the int value. But we can also do kind of more uh, complex stuff here, such as uh, and there it is evaluating this particular line of code, and you're seeing the end result right here. And then you can actually take said expression and watch it. So if you need to do some on the fly calculations, et cetera, you'll see right down here, that code is now there. And as any of these values change, it will automatically update. So this is really a conditional thing. It's, it's hard to want to do a contrived example of, but you will find yourself wanting to evaluate things kind of more dynamically or you know doing some slightly more advanced testing on them. That's where expression evaluation comes in. Very, very useful. And the final thing I didn't really jump into, and I probably should in more detail, is you'll notice within our um, demo class here, our contrived class, we've also got a string. And a string class is a kind of a non-trivial class in C++. So jumping into it in the debugger 
is probably an interesting thing to do. So here you can see our watch or even our local, either window, it's the same thing. They're, they're both views at the same particular piece of information. Uh, so you come here and go D and you'll see here's our string value. One thing that we can zoom in on it and it does some nice things for actually breaking it down. Now our string value is hello and you can see here our string, um, you can see the capacity allocated for it is 15. Over here you can see the particular type we're dealing with, so it's unsigned in. And then you kind of get, here's where it can get a little confusing, is when you start jumping into more and more detail, this is an STL class. And you can see the pieces that go together and make it up. And you can really kind of zoom in and down and get more and more detail on your classes. Or you can just ignore all that and look at the nicely uh, abstracted high level version for you. Or you can even look at the raw version over here. So this is one of those things that, um, it, it's giving you multiple views of the same piece of data. Uh, this string isn't so simple as being just this, but that is the data of said string represented in array form. So you can see entry zero, entry one, entry two, entry three, entry four. So your locals, autos, and watch windows, they're basically you know different scopes. Uh, so uh, your locals are basically everything that's in the current scope and your watch is basically anything that you've told it that you're interested in. Even if it's, and if it's out of scope, it will show basically that it's not available right now. But at any particular time, if it is a complex class, such as D was here, uh, you can drill down into it and get more and more detail as you want to go down. So that is one of those things to be aware of. So if you're working on a game class, for example, and you had uh, an orc, orc had um, a base class of you know monster, a monster had data of type uh, hit points, and then uh, might contain another class of type weapons or an array of class type weapons. This is the same thing. You can just start drilling down deeper and deeper and deeper to get to the information you need if you want. And then oftentimes you'll get down to a particular piece of information information that is so buried down here that you know is of interest to you so you basically want to read this particular buffer right, so here we are the buffer um, so we saw earlier on there's a capacity of 15 size of 5 so that means we're currently using 5 bytes but 15 were allocated but well, here's the raw data buffer that a standard string is using behind the scenes and there you can see it's got 15 in length uh, but only five are used, there's the null terminator, and then the rest is garbage. And this is the kind of information you use when drilling down. And if there was a piece of information that you are specifically interested in, uh, such as this particular line right here, at any particular time, you can go ahead and add a watch to it. And you will see, let me just drill all that down, that watch evaluates just to that very, very, very specific thing. And if you don't want to watch anymore, just go ahead, come on up here, delete the watch, and it's gone. This is all just views into your code. Deleting a watch does not in any way affect your code at all. It's sort of just the same as uh, deleting a breakpoint. A breakpoint has no effect on your code. It just exists in the debugger. And none of this means anything when your code is built for release. None of this information is available in there. It doesn't slow your code down. This is just something you use while developing your code. Um, and really, that was all I intended to cover today. There's a lot of topic there, so I hope I didn't lose you. And again, if you want more details, pretty much everything we just covered, slightly different code as the example, uh, is available in this document that I will link down below. So if you're interested in learning more about debugging or if you just want you know, a bit more information on what we just covered, this is available. And as I said, when we started this all off, if you are working in uh, JavaScript development in Internet Explorer or uh, Chrome, all of this functionality is available there as well. It might be called a little bit differently, but there is a debugger and it uses the same process, uses the same terminology. You will find there's expression evaluation. It might not be called um, uh, quick watch, it might call an expression evaluator, uh, but it is there. There's breakpoints, there's a call stack, there's the ability to step into, step over, step uh, up, step into, over, and out. Those are in every single debugger you are going to find. Generally, you will find a call stack available, etc. So everything we just looked at today will be available everywhere else. Now, there is one last thing that's not technically part of this demo, but I should show it as well. And this is going to change a lot between compilers. So I don't want to get into too much detail. But another thing you should be aware of is exceptions. So what you see here is our code finishes and then we delete data. So now what I'm going to do is do it again. And this is what we call exceptional. You should not do this. You're basically deleting memory that's been deleted. Your code is not going to be happy. It's going to run. There's no breakpoints here. So I'm just going ahead. I'm running my code and then kaboom. 
what just happened is I threw an exception. And this is nice actually for showing you uh, how the call stack works and, and kind of a real world example for dealing with it. But basically, this just spit out an exception. I'm coming down here, uh, we copy the details out. Now our exception isn't giving us a whole lot of information here. Um, I don't even know what exception we're dealing with, but if we look at our particular code, we know that it is in the um, delete scalar CVP library. So basically we're in the standard C library that this code blew up. Uh, we can see that, you know, the parameters passed in. So you can see there's the block of data, the memory address that was um, blown. Um, it was in this free debug. So now this is some code we're gonna wanna try and figure out. Well, we're in NTDLL. So we're literally in um, basically the Windows code or the C runtime code. And this is kind of outside of our domain. In some cases, you may not actually even have access to this. And you notice as we walk up, we'll see more and more. And if you really want, you can jump into the disassembly of the code you're dealing with. But if you don't have something called a PDB file, which is you know a file that contains the debugging information, you may not necessarily have the information you want. But our handy call stack will show us oops, the uh, pieces that basically our call. So you can see here the last call that this is the point we blew up was in this. I don't want the disassembly anymore. Stop that. So we know that our actual blow up point is at this particular call, but we want to see where we actually died. You look down over here. Here is the last one that was from our actual executable. We come on back to it. We click it and go back to main and you will see the line of code that it highlights is in fact where the delete call was. So we can trace it back. And there is the offending line of code. So that is where your call stack becomes invaluable and how exceptions work. Now there's um, also specifics for dealing with exceptions, but exceptions vary so much from um, you know tool to tool that it's not worth covering at this point. So that is again, an exercise for the reader. All right, really that is it. That's a lot of information to cover. I hope I didn't lose you there. I hope that was interesting. Now again, if you stuck with me and you already knew all this and this was just mind-numbingly boring to you, well, first off, congratulations on your perseverance. Uh, but again, as I did say to start this, this is one-on-one -on -one level stuff, but it's not stuff that is commonly taught. So if this is all new to you, I really, really caution you to take this, that stuff you saw today and get out there and practice it. Start using it. Stop doing uh, standard output prints to the command line. You will find once you learn how to use a debugger properly, this is going to make you a far better programmer. So if this is all new to you, take the time to learn it. It is very much a worthwhile skill to pick up. One of the most valuable, uh, basically after the ability to research and the ability to write code, the ability to debug code is probably the third most important trait for a programmer. So do be aware of that. Do take the time to learn this more, but there's not a lot more to it, to be honest. The rest comes down to the ticks and down, tips and tracks that tips and technique and the same basically with you know any skill as you get more advanced today but the basic tools are everything we just covered today and not much more so i hope you some of you at least learned something from this i hope you did find it useful if you did please do click like it really is important uh, to the channels to development especially for some of the recent changes they've made to youtube and of course we cover all kinds of stuff generally it's more game dev related but this is kind of just dev in general related uh, but we have got all kinds of game dev related content here on game from scratch so if you like this do click subscribe hopefully i'll keep you interested in the future all right that's it for now hope you did enjoy that again the article is linked down below in the comments if you want more detail and if you do want to have specifics of certain languages or certain technologies, do let me know and I'll do my best to see if I can cover those in more detail. All right, see y'all later.